Hello and welcome to Living Science. Today we have with us Professor P. Bagam, a well-known name in the field of structural biology. He was the director of Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore from 2005 to 14. Professor Bagram has made outstanding contributions in understanding structures of synthetic and natural peptides. He was amongst the first ones to utilize mass spectrometry and NMR spectroscopy in early 70s to solve biological problems. He has published over 400 papers in reputed journals and continues to be actively involved in research. Professor Balram has received numerous awards in recognition of his work including Padm Bhushan in 2014 and Padm Shri in 2002 by the Government of India and Shanti Sru Bhatnagar Award in 1986, the most prestigious award in science. He is a fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences and Indian National Academy INSA. He was the editor of Current Science for almost two decades and has served on several editorial boards. Apart from his academic accomplishments, what strikes one most about Professor Balram is his extremely student-friendly nature and his passion to take challenging problems. In all my interactions with him, he has come across as a pleasant, unassuming, approachable personality in spite of his celebrity stature in biological sciences. He embodies the Sanskrit slok Vidya Dadati Vinyam, meaning knowledge makes you humble. Uh, Professor Balram, very welcome and thank you for being with us. Yes, I'm glad to be here. So, we'll get started and um, so, you finished your PhD at 23, when most of us actually start PhD and from Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh in USA. So, what part of edu conventional education you skipped? No, no, I didn't skip anything. Uh, it was just that uh, I didn't take very long for my PhD and maybe I skipped one or two years in school. And uh, I did my PhD in a little less than three years. So I guess I came out early. So Professor Balram, what brought you back to India after finishing PhD? No, I just came back automatically because in those days I had gone to do a PhD, I finished my PhD. So it looked absolutely logical to come back and uh, work here. So when we talk about uh, IIC Bangalore, so one name comes first and that's uh, G. N. Ramachandran and you had shared uh, some time with him. So can we uh, know from you what's the most distinct memory you have of him? See, G. N. Ramachandran in my view was the most outstanding scientist in India produced in the post-independence era. When I saw him, he was already a very distinguished senior professor. He also had uh, a worldwide reputation. And uh, the impression that I always have of him is that he was one person I have seen who was interested in science and only science. And uh, he had very little patience for anything else. Do you have any other personal stories to share of him? Yes, he was uh, quite a remarkable character. Mm -hmm. uh, he was always thinking about the subject that he was researching. And therefore, he was not the person who would make a routine conversation. Mm -hmm. He was very intense. So anything that he was thinking about, he concentrated on it. He was very impatient and he was in all senses, I would say, uh, uh, a difficult man. Uh, and that was because of his extraordinary uh, abilities and insight. And therefore, he was impatient with people who did not have the same kind of uh, understanding. Yeah. I must say that... Uh, I didn't know much about him until I joined his department. By the time he left the department when he was old, I was actually worshipping him in many ways. Not him as an individual, but the kind of work that I realized that he had done. So talking about work, and you worked extensively on studying peptide structures, synthetic and natural. And you also uh, have had peptides with the rare amino acids, AIB, and you kind of master figuring out how many AIB lead to alpha helical structure 310 and extra. And you've also uh, made changes with the beta amino acid gamma and omega uh, 
So it's all interesting work. And in this, uh, so what drove you to study these peptide structures in so much detail? Well, I originally started studying peptides because when I came to Bangalore and worked in Ramachandran's department, I realized that uh, one would really have to do something that was of interest to the department. And Ramachandran was interested in proteins and peptides. And uh, very few people were working on peptides in the 1970s, in the mid-1970s. And uh, I learned conformational analysis from my colleagues in the department, who were all Ramachandran students. And I began experimental work on peptides. Once I began that, I found it was fruitful. I was getting results which uh, other people found interesting. I got results which my surroundings found interesting. And therefore, I just continued with peptides. After a little while, uh, I just became uh, more and more involved with studying peptide conformations in designing peptides. And uh, I've stayed with it uh, throughout my career. Professor Balram, you've also invested a lot of time studying disulfide bonds with NMR and, uh, and, and mass spec much later on. So what was what was so interesting to study these? Uh, does it tell you some pattern? Uh, and what was you know your curiosity to go after them? Well, I don't know. I think this is something that uh, students might actually uh, uh, think about a little. How do you find a research problem? Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, it's quite easy to find a research problem because everybody seems to be telling you uh, what are the most important problems of the times. But when I started out. There wasn't anybody telling you what to do. So you actually read the literature and tried to find uh, a problem. One of the things that I read, which I did not understand at all at that time, was Ramachandran's famous review in Advances in Protein Chemistry, where there is a small section on disulfide rings, which are uh, rather small in size. That is, between the two cysteine residues, there are not many amino acid residues. What would be their structures? And then I realized that there was hardly any work in the literature on this. So I began to synthesize those molecules and study disulfide conformations. As I was doing this, a work on thioredoxins and luteredoxins began to appear in the literature. And it turns out that the active sites of these important molecules, which regulate the redox balance in cells, now have small 14-membered disulfides. So I then, of course, began to give a slightly different slant to the introductions to my papers by saying that they are important because the thyroidoxins and luteridoxins are important. And I even once got an invitation to go and speak in a conference on thyroidoxins, although that was not the reason I really began, uh, began the work. So the no a lot of this knowledge you generated with the structures it can be very useful in industry. So did any of your work led to, uh, you know, in translation research? Yes, I think very many times the kind of work that's been done on conformational constraints, on the use of AIB residues in pharmaceutically important molecules, uh, this has been done in the literature. I believe it has been done only because of all this fundamental work which exists. But even in India, there have been attempts to use this. Uh, DABA at one point in its research center was making uh, peptide molecules for anti-cancer work. And they did, I think, introduce into those uh, the unusual constrained amino acids that we had studied. And this was largely because someone who had worked with me then went along to work with, uh, with Dabur. But even very recently, I have seen in the literature that these amino acids are being used for many peptides of interest in uh, neurodegenerative uh, disease. So I think fundamental principles that you learn can be applied uh, quite usefully in the pharmaceutical industry. And Professor Balam, you understand protein structures much better than anybody and you've seen so many of them, solved so many of them. So do you think the evolution somehow, uh, how does evolution affect protein structure, sequence, you know, three-dimensional structure? And is, are there uh, the function gets more evolution, you know, what's get priority or, you know, is there a sequence, or how evolution affects the structure, sequence and function? See, I think this is a problem that I'm interested in currently. And I think uh, evolutionary biochemistry uh, 
is now acquiring a new dimension. And we have uh, great interest in trying to understand how mutational events during the course of evolution have shaped the structure and function of proteins. We know very little about primordial proteins. We know very little about evolutionary precursors for the proteins that we have today. All proteins that you see in every organism look like all proteins in every other organism. Biochemistry is not dramatically different. At the same time, here and there, you will see some signals where the imprint of evolution can be recognized on molecules. I think with a very large number of three-dimensional structures and protein sequences pouring into the databases, I think there will be considerable interest in understanding evolutionary relationships, how mutations have shaped proteins, and the problem of co-evolution of clusters of amino acid residues in proteins. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. I would not uh, say that uh, I have done uh, a great deal of work in this, but I can see that this field has an enormous potential. And to answer these questions, you've used these techniques uh, very well, NMR, X-ray, and CD, and you were kind of pioneer early on in 70s, you used them. So uh, what was the status of these techniques back in 70s when you started working on them? Yes, when I started working on them, it, they were uh, much less sophisticated than they are today. For example, NMR methods then, uh, two-dimensional NMR had not even been thought of. It was many years into the future. And therefore, I think uh, I was fortunate because when you are using techniques which are not very sophisticated at a given time, uh, you might be uh, able to do things which appear interesting to other people. And this is how I did a lot of my early work on peptide conformation. Today, of course, those techniques are enormously sophisticated. And I think it is very much more difficult to uh, uh, apply them and get people interested in your results. And from sophistication has also brought high throughput screen. And these techniques are now majorly, especially mass spec is used in high screening all the time. And it's almost become a routine in most of the lab. But uh, some people would even argue that this is, technique has become so sophisticated and leads to so much generation of data. And in frustration, it can be even called junk in, junk out, generating machine. <laughs> so what are your thoughts? In, and do you think the it's not the machine, but the computational capability has not kept the pace with uh, inferring the data from such machine? Well, you've asked me a long question. And uh, I not sure that I completely understood what you asked, but I will say something general taking mass spectrometry as an example. I believe mass spectrometry today certainly in India is being used without uh, a complete understanding of both its power and its limitations. And uh, this is because the techniques have a huge applied uh, possibility. and. Uh, I think people are jumping the gun a little bit without uh, completely understanding the underpinnings of the technique. But at the same time, I think these techniques are very powerful. We need more and more people to be using these techniques and to actually become uh, technically competent in uh, both generation as well as analysis of it. Professor Varam, you're a big fan of using technique and you mastered them to a larger extent and now you're investing your time in next generation sequencing. Uh, what kind of question are you looking at to answer with the, this? Well, I think next generation sequencing is a marvelous technique, uh, depending upon which problem you want to study. I have been interested primarily in trying to get sequences of uh, cone snail venom peptides, conotoxins using next generation sequencing data. This way it is very easy to identify toxin genes. And what we've been working on are methods by which you can take the mass of data that you get from uh, next generation sequencing to identify the genes of interest to us. And I think here when we get sequences, that helps us to go back and interpret mass spectra of uh, natural venom mixtures. So I'm Currently, I'm certainly no expert on next generation sequencing, 
but I can see that it's going to be very, very useful to us. Yeah. So this technique, obviously, you know, NMR, X-ray, they've made huge difference in modern sciences. Mm -hmm. And so some students would wonder, like, what will it take, uh, what kind of investment or mentoring that uh, some technique or a machine comes out of India and we can ask specific questions. But you know, techniques are invented in response to a scientific imperative. And uh, there must be a scientific question which is being asked, which cannot be solved with the existing techniques. And that's when you think of a new technique. Uh, I am not sure that that kind of work is actually being done in many places in India. Uh, when you look at the evolution of techniques, very many times the technique already existed in physics and uh, its applications eventually turn out entirely in chemistry and biology. And there is a point at which people recognize that this technique might be useful and then begin to investigate it. I don't think techniques have a nationality, so I wouldn't worry too much about whether a technique was developed here or not. And the, it's interesting that you asked me this question today, because today we are celebrating uh, Science Day and we are celebrating the Raman effect. Now, the Raman effect is used in so many places in a manner in which Raman would have never anticipated. and. Uh, that tells you that fundamental science uh, can have great application, but not necessarily at the time that the fundamental science is done. Professor Balram, I'm kind of bringing back to you to your own work, and uh, so uh, you've also worked on uh, water channels, and it was a very interesting problem uh, to solve, actually, and very difficult probably at the same time. So, can you please share that uh, story with us? How you um, ended up working with that question? So very often I have worked on problems in which I've had no question to ask at the beginning. Uh, that's one way of doing science, where you just make observations. Mm -hmm. And you make observations in the course of whatever work you're doing. And in this particular case, uh, we were working on these peptides, we were working on their structures, and then we just accidentally or serendipitously found that uh, the molecules had this very interesting structure with a water channel running through. What was interesting about that particular structure was that the lining of the channel was completely hydrophobic. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the water molecules which were inside the channel now did not have any kind of hydrogen bonding interaction with the walls of the channel. So this was water confined in a hydrophobic environment. And it therefore turns out that you have a linear chain of hydrogen bonds and as a consequence, you have a wire of water. And it's very rare to be able to actually crystallographically characterize a wire of water. But I don't think we had a question. Uh, we had an answer, and then we framed the question. Okay, very interesting, actually. Uh, uh, so another work from, uh, you invested time on tin barrels, tin uh, triphosphate isomerase enzyme specifically. And you have uh, characterized the structure, function, and role of cysteines. Uh, can you uh, share, like, from so you were working on peptide structures, and then you moved to proteins. So how did you ended up working on Tim? Well, I don't think the way we started working on the Tim barrel protein is necessarily a model that should be followed by anybody. Mm -hmm. But it just so happened that my wife was working for a company, Astra, at that time. And uh, they were in the 90s now standardizing procedures for cloning and expression pro uh, proteins. This hadn't actually been done at that time very much. And uh, Tim was taken up from the malarial parasite Plasmodium falciparum as just a test case for cloning and expression, sequencing the DNA and all of that. So she did get a clone, but the company was not very much interested in it and she left the company. And uh, at that time, I asked the company, can I get the clone? And they said, uh, yes, of course. They, of course, made me sign an agreement because in case I made great discoveries afterwards that they would get uh, the proceeds from it. So I've had the clone with me. Then I realized that if this, it was a very well-behaved protein. It was also from the malarial parasite. And therefore, anybody else who heard you would think that you're working on malaria and uh, think you're doing something useful. 
But I was actually interested only in using the uh, clone and the expressed protein as a way of learning crystallography, as a way of learning more biochemistry and of a way of learning how protein sequences affect uh, structure. So I've ended up maybe now from about the mid 1990s, I spent 20 years working with this uh, and I've slowly become interested in every aspect of the protein, uh, its uh, mechanism of action. And then I realized that here is an enzyme which everybody thinks is very well understood. And there is a mechanism in the textbooks. It's a mechanism which, uh, in the words of Jeremy Knowles, runs counter to the prejudices of mechanistic chemistry. So there's more to investigate. So I would say it's a model system on which I've used uh, much of, on which I've learned a great deal. So in this work, actually, one of your papers have shown that the active site, not just the amino acid which are involved in catalysis, but even the amino acids which are surrounding the active site also play a very important role, like the polarity and then the environment, ionic environment they generate. Yes, because if you have a model enzyme, and especially one that is as well behaved and well studied, then you can if examine the effects of mutations. Now, if you take an enzyme, the same enzyme exists in every organism. It's what you would dismiss as a housekeeping enzyme. But you must remember that housekeepers are very, very important. They actually keep the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, now you can ask the question, are the sequences of these housekeeping enzymes the same in every organism? It isn't. Mm -hmm. So if you have 250 amino acids, you will find that 200 of them can be mutated. What are the remaining amino acids doing? That's the question that you can ask by making uh, specific mutations and in understanding what does evolution conserve. There's something that it must absolutely conserve. It must conserve the residues for catalytic chemistry, but it must also conserve certain residues which allow the catalytic site to be positioned appropriately. See, the requirements for catalysis are very much more stringent than the requirements for folding or the requirements for protein-protein recognition. Because chemistry can be done only with very specific distances. So in the same study, you mentioned somewhere, it got mentioned that active site can be transported. Hmm. So is that the best we can do? Uh, is it possible or the best we can do is just a site, you know, the engineering of active site? Well, right now, protein engineering, although it's been practiced for about 20 years now, is still not truly engineering. Because in engineering, uh, suppose an engineer wants now to make uh, a car, he doesn't end up making either a bicycle or an aeroplane. Uh, whereas in the case of protein engineering, many times you do not know what is going to happen when you make a mutation. You can have a lot of background information which allows you to design very carefully some mutations. But I think rational design of protein active sites is still being practiced by very few groups with, I would say, limited success. So I wouldn't uh, claim in any way that it's going to be easy for people to uh, completely engineer active sites with new catalytic activity, for example. And uh, so in Plasmodium falciparum, you also studied few other aspects of protease active sites. And you had this very interesting peptide structure which has many protease sites and you had a quencher and fluorescence and it was very interesting study. So how did you even think of, I mean, not that I'm questioning you know, but how did you think of such an interesting way of looking at proteases in view, I mean, you looked at kind of profile them. Well, I must confess that I didn't think about it at all. I was part of a CSIR project uh, in which CSIR was looking at a means of developing green technologies for removing hair from leather. And in this biotechnological approach to dehairing leather, you needed proteases which, which would just remove uh, the hair from leather. But at the same time, these proteases should not remove the collagen because then the leather will not have any value. And so you want to separate a protease activity from collagenase activity. Collagenase is a specific protease. So I was part of this project and they said we need an assay. So I developed an assay for uh, proteases which could be used rapidly, which involved fluorescence quenching, internal quenchers, 
So, when the molecule was cut, then the fluorescent signal would come up and you can put any sequence in between and that is how I made the protease substrates. I do not think it is something that I would have done by myself and I suspect it is the only time that I did anything useful where I think CSIR eventually found it useful for uh, uh, screening all the protease samples. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised that CSIR even patented it. So, I have patents on it, although I would not really uh, claim very much. Yes. Very nice, interesting story. So, um, uh, coming back to the structures and which is your main domain and, uh, and so, uh, now at, a, at an accelerated rate, we are coming up with lot and lot of structures and solving them with X-ray and MR. Mm -hmm. And, but uh, it would be impossible to kind of solve all the structures of proteins and peptides which are naturally occurring. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but however, now you now days you can use computational biology and you can take help of uh, computational ability to find the structures. So, in your opinion, how reliable are these existing models in predicting the structure of a protein are? Well, I would say I'm very much of an experimentalist. I would say if you can do an experiment to determine a structure, you better do an experiment to determine the structure. Uh, with theoretical modeling, they're just models. Mm -hmm. And there are very few ways of actually determining whether a model is actually strictly correct or not. Validating models is difficult. But uh, modeling has its place. But I would still say as far as proteins are concerned, protein structure determination is an experimental science. It would be very difficult to provide a structure for a protein which did not resemble any other protein that is known. The only way of doing that would be to actually determine the structure. And to determine a structure actually is a lengthy process. You will agree gene cloning and then expression and then purification. And then some would even argue in a structure biology lab, like why not just outsource these all the steps required. So, what would you tell them? Do you agree or would you empathize with them at all? I do not know, maybe I belong to a generation which is fast fading, but uh, I would imagine that if you outsourced everything that you have just told me about, then you must ask yourself a very important question, what are you doing? And uh, uh, is it that you are sitting at your desk and uh, thinking very purely and providing some conceptual understanding at a very high level? Actually, when you think about this, you will find that uh, some of these technologies have become uh, commercial and therefore a lot of research can be outsourced. But then the questions that have to be asked after the results of outsourcing have come in must be somewhat uh, more complex questions. I would certainly not subscribe to the fact that a PhD student writes a thesis in which uh, everything that is done in the thesis is outsourced. and. Uh, you would really wonder what the student has actually learned in the process. Techniques are very important to learn. But in technically speaking, how uh, good are we in, so, I mean, in terms of uh, we have established well in India with structural biology um, programs almost in every city, every institute. Uh, so, how are we doing internationally if you compare structural biology, Indian structural biology, if you compare internationally, do we have a standing? Yes, I think the Indian structural biology, particularly X-ray diffraction, mm -hmm. has developed very well over the years and there are many people who have done very good structures in India. Uh, maybe we do not have as many people as there are outside, but I think the structural biology community has also been limited to some extent by the fact that we do not have access to synchrotron radiation in India. So, one has to go abroad to collect data and also I do not think there is sufficient amount of integration of the various kinds of biological problems that people are looking at with the people who are structurally uh, very well, uh, are very competent in structure determination. We have had pockets, uh, Bangalore has been one, there have been pockets in Hyderabad, in Delhi and so forth where there has been excellent work going on in structural biology. Just a little while back, I was asking about your own work, did it get translated at all? So, because uh, a lot of bi uh, biology we do in India is basic science. Mm -hmm. so, do you think uh, uh, basic scientists should be encouraged to pursue uh, more applied questions or if they have an answer which can uh, be translated, how could this be encouraged that you know you can kind of balance basic and applied science or the basic science kind of moves towards applied science? 
I don't really have an answer to this because I don't know how you encourage translational research. Uh, in fact, I'm always worried about this term encouragement because uh, government believes encouragement means giving money and uh, for a particular activity. But I must say this, I've been a basic scientist. I couldn't have been anything else because I was in an academic institution and uh, my job was actually to teach students and my job was to do some research. It is only now that science has become such a highly organized uh, activity. If I had thought during the course of my work that something could be translated to make me uh, millions of rupees or millions of dollars, it's quite possible that I might have thought about it. But I don't think I encountered a problem in which that kind of commercial possibility really existed. I think this drive to translate must actually come also from individuals. Uh, there must be some kinds of individuals who are really motivated towards translation. And uh, I don't think translation can be done by labeling an institution as a translational institution. Uh, but we must uh, have an inner drive to translate. Do you think here a collaborative science might help? Uh Yes, there, collaborative science is the way to translate, there's no doubt. But the question is, who do you collaborate with? In India, we have not had a sufficient, we have not had enlightened industry with whom one could collaborate. In fact, I would say as far as support of research is concerned, public support by government has been much, much better than support by industry. And uh so now actually I am getting at more personal questions and you have done really well in research. Then one wonders like what excites you every day to go to lab and how do you stay excited about research and, and, and how do you recharge yourself after a busy day and you must have had lab. Oh no, it's the other way around. I don't think I have done terribly well in research. You know, I could have done a lot better. Uh, there is no doubt that everybody can do very much better than what they have done. I wouldn't say I need to recharge myself at a busy day. I would say I recharge myself only when I go to the lab. If I am away from the lab, I find it, uh, I mean, just hanging around in the lab and hanging around with uh, students, talking to people, is more of a hobby than work. And uh, this is why I sometimes feel that uh, science is a wonderful profession. It's the only profession in which you get paid to do what you like. And uh, when you are an artist or an author, you'd better make a good painting or you better write a good book if you want to live well. Otherwise, you are not going to uh, earn well. And I think this is something that uh, scientists must recognize. Today, however, science has become very much more professional. Uh, in that case, it's just another profession in which you must carry out your activities such that whatever goals are there must be achieved. But for certainly for people like me, uh, science has not been uh, work, but science has been uh, a hobby uh, to do. Uh. It's for you, but sometimes actually PhD students when they're starting out, they might feel frustrated because of you know the complication of a question or you know failure in some experiment. So how can they be? They, they can stay excited. Yeah, this I don't know. I, I am just a casual observer of the scene. Uh, I feel that uh, there's too much focus, uh, there's too much uh, demand on certain kinds of results. And uh, I've always had PhD students, many of them, uh, don't have a proper problem for a while. And they're just doing something. So I think you can find a lot of interesting things by messing around. And uh, that I think is much less possible nowadays because uh, institutions, supervisors, students, all of them are a little bit uh, focused. If there is one word which I find very difficult to uh, accept being used, it's the word focus. Because uh, sometimes you might actually focus on the wrong thing. And if you're a little bit defocused, you might actually find something which is worthwhile uh, focusing on. But I'm in a minority on that. So, <laughs> so, uh.
with talking about focus and you know but sometime how early on in your career as a student how do you know that you found the right focus because is it the right question and you know how does a, a student know that maybe this is the focus they should need to focus on i don't know you know as a student if you are really interested in what you're doing mm-hmm. and you've done a lot of uh, things or uh, let's say most of them are unsuccessful uh uh-huh. but you still done a lot of things you'll eventually find enough to write a phd thesis uh if every phd thesis was a uh, path breaking discovery we would have uh, by now have nothing to do in science and this is known to everybody it's known to every supervisor it's known to everybody who's got a phd that at the end of it the phd degree is obtained by uh, efflux of time uh, after some time you just fed up you can't do any more and uh, you argue with your supervisor and you write your thesis and go somewhere else so i think when you're doing a phd research it is very important uh, to like the research that you're doing to learn many things about the problem that you're working on even if you're not very successful you know how is success judged success is judged by publications and sometimes you may not have publications but you're still learned a huge amount then the job is done Professor uh, Balram will wrap up by asking because you've been part of Indian science for quite some time, and uh, uh, so we want to know how has the Indian science has changed from let's say early seventies, sixties to now, and has the funding agencies have changed their focus or they're putting more money? How was the entire scenario in comparison to? See, in the early stages of my career, there were no funding agencies, and therefore there were no funds, and that. at some point i thought was the best phase of my career because then you did whatever you liked nobody expected anything of you there was no committee to ask what you were doing and why are you doing this no one ever asked me what's the grand question that you're working on and uh, we still managed to stay in the lab from morning to night uh, even if we had nothing to do and uh, generally i think we learned something or the other Uh, later on when the funding agencies came the first few years were nice because uh, committees had still not learned what are uh, the questions that they should not ask afterwards they learned which questions they should not ask but went on asking only those questions and uh, right now i think the funding agencies are in a crisis and i don't think anybody recognizes that they are in a crisis or if they recognize that they are in a crisis they don't want to say they are in a crisis but i think they must come out of it and uh, sort of pull their act together and support science in its broadest sense because i think science is a general investment for uh, the country and science must be treated as a public good and uh, therefore there must be constant support for it the bureaucracy which supports it must be an enlightened bureaucracy and in india it is becoming extremely difficult to find enlightenment in bureaucratic circles professor baram thank you so much for being with us and so much for your time thank you thank you for being with living science i hope you enjoyed our interaction with professor p baram and his insights into structural biology thanks again